Everyone faces some stress every day. Sometimes those things that act as stressors challenge our sense of good self-esteem. Today, I'm going to talk to you about a simple way to help refocus your mental attitude to emphasize your sense of value and accomplishment, and thus reduce your senses of impotence and inadequacy. Now, if you're consistently depressed or emotionally eviscerated, you should seek professional counseling. But if you want to feel a little more motivated, this is a good modality for you. This is an attitudinal tune-up that I call a grand scheme for self-esteem, which works in a way similar to a regular gratitude practice. You simply surround yourself with reminders that you are worthy, accomplished, and beloved, and part of a valuable tradition to set up a strong mental platform from which you can leap to greater success. Arguably, the best method of consistently supporting your sense of accomplishment is to keep a daily to-do list. Not only does it give you a list of accomplishments at the end of the day, but it helps keep you on track to get more of the important stuff done. So definitely keep a daily practice of a to-do list and a gratitude journal. These two activities are excellent for keeping you focused on productivity and happy while you're producing. Other various modalities that the Benson Henry Institute advocates for the mitigation of the stress response, including breathing exercises, meditation, rhythmic activity, and other forms of cognitive restructuring. This will likely be more subtle. You're likely to see more tangible results more quickly from a regular exercise program, such as a vigorous daily walk or any fun activity that gets your heart rate up, plus an abundance of sleep. This is a simple mental shift that can be beneficial for coping with stress and striving for success. Robert Sapolsky of Stanford in his excellent book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, explains that when animals, such as zebras, encounter a life-threatening event, such as a lion, a whole chemical cascade of hormones is released throughout the body, improving their abilities to fight, which is a bad idea with a lion, or run away. The problem for humans is that unlike zebras who forget about the danger after it's passed and let the chemicals dissipate, Humans keep the danger in their minds, sometimes obsessing about it, and the chemicals stay as long as the sense of danger does. Sapolsky writes, The stress response can be mobilized not only in response to physical or psychological insults, but also in the expectation of them. In other words, the way that you think about yourself and the reaction to the slings and arrows that you may encounter daily initiate deleterious biochemical reactions in your body. Over time, this leads to chronic stress and chronic disease. The other thing that humans do to our disadvantage is that we take events that are not life-threatening, like an insult, and we react physiologically as if our lives were in danger. A mental focus on the daily slings and arrows of modern life can lead to chronic disease. Sometimes when I was disheartened, my dad would say, in a thousand years, no one will know the difference. Although that rarely made me feel better, it's true. In fact, most of our day-to-day -day troubles will be forgotten in a couple of years from now. In the grand scheme of things, very few of the things that give us stress will be remembered a year from now. So why do we often react physiologically as if they're life-threatening? It's to our benefit to have a bastion of self-esteem built in our consciousness so that when we face those slings and arrows, they'll affect us physiologically no more than if our child lodged an infantile insult at us. Now let me say clearly that I don't mean that you should ignore good feedback that others may be desperate to give you. Sometimes others are accurate when they give you their unflattering opinion. But I'm suggesting that you can shift your perspective to make those moments feel more productive and less punitive. My family might be demonstrative of two different ways of looking at your place in the grand scheme of things. When I was a kid, my father's mother would yammer on about her ancestors, three of whom came to America on the Mayflower, and ten of whom fought in the Revolutionary War. To me at the time, play was a lot more important and interesting than ancestry, but to my grandmother. Her family tradition was an important instrument for her sense that she was special. Lots of people are like my student Josh Yu, who say things like, I always do what my parents tell me to do, I'm Korean. Or my student Dalia Barsamian, who would say, it's important for me to have a professional career because I come from an Armenian family. In the worldview of my grandmother, she was the legacy of a great tradition, and as part of that tradition, it was her obligation to represent who she was as a productive and valuable member of society. Josh and Dahlia probably feel the same way. As it turns out, a lot of Americans in the 17th century had a lot of children. 
So a lot of families from New England had the same familial roots and they couldn't care less about it, their history or their ancestry. But my grandmother used those mental affiliations as her inspirations to guide her aspirations and to guide her behavior to be in concert with that tradition and to see herself as worthy of performing and receiving the best in life. Others use vocations or avocations to guide their aspirations. My mother's ancestors had a decidedly more prosaic past. That doesn't mean she didn't have traditions that she could use uh, to elevate her aspirations. My mother affiliated her values and aspirations with the church, in which she is still active, and her profession as a teacher and as a patriotic American who served in the military. Many people use their religious traditions to guide them. Those who garden, cook, volunteer for charity, play sports, or are even proud of their professions also have traditions from which they can affiliate themselves proudly. My student Alex Miller aspires to serve in the U.S. Secret Service and affiliates with that service even though he doesn't even work there yet. Joining a church or club is an excellent way to affiliate yourself with a grand tradition. Like many of you, I graduated from the University of California, which has a very impressive tradition of scholarship. Even though I have not yet won of the Nobel Prizes that have been awarded to those affiliated with the University of California, I am part of that tradition. Every time I elevate my intellect, I improve the luster of the university because I too am affiliated with the university. Everyone who works for the university or even just goes to one of the sporting events participates in a proud tradition. What if you're not a shining light in a particular tradition? You might be a realist like one of my students, Jake Anderson, who likes to quote Margaret Mead. Always remember that you're absolutely unique, just like everybody else. It is true that compared to the history of humanity, it is likely that we're all relatively insignificant. However, in your own world, you are the absolute star, and how you act and react in that world determines how high in the heavens you'll ascend. More practically, you're the only one who can make the decisions for you, and it's best for you to make the decisions that keep your spirits high. For your perception of yourself, it's best that you affiliate yourself with excellence and step forward as an exemplar of that excellence. Sometimes you might feel as if you're an insignificant cog in the machine. Sometimes your superiors might encourage that belief. You might have a manager that interacts with you in such a way that might lead you to believe that you're inadequate. For example, I have a friend whose manager said she can never achieve a perfect performance appraisal because no one is absolutely perfect. I have another friend who is told that he has excellent job performance and is better than his peers, but his credentials aren't adequate for a promotion that doesn't require credentials. You might have family members who treat you sometimes as if you're not deserving of respect. Even Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown. I'm not suggesting that you become an exemplar of your noble tradition so that others can judge you differently. A person who judges says more about himself than the person he's judging. You're doing it so that you have an unshakable confidence which will serve as a foundation for your greater success. I'm also not suggesting that you brag about your affiliations. No one likes a bragger. This mental association is for your benefit only. However, if you associate with those who are excellent in a particular endeavor or tradition, then it's likely that you'll talk about excellent behavior with those people and you'll become more accomplished yourself. I suggest that you surround yourself with those things that remind you that you are accomplished and beloved. Put up photos up at your office and home of those times when you accomplished something. Put up photos of those who've been supportive of you. Play music on your iPod that reminds you of good times past or contemporary songs that have inspirational messages for you. Put that degree on the wall. Remind yourself as often as possible that you are worthy, accomplished, and beloved. Einstein used his imagination to move markedly beyond what was the academic knowledge of his day. But you might recall that I mentioned earlier that it is our imaginations of danger that trigger the stress response. When it comes to stress, your imagination is much more important than knowledge. That is why it is important for you to use your imagination to know that you are strong enough to handle simple stressors without worry. I don't mean that you should imagine things that aren't true about yourself. I'm advocating that you take knowledge of what you have accomplished in the past with the support that you have available to you to imagine what you can accomplish today and in the future. Focus on your aspirations, don't focus on failure, and don't let others convince you that you're a failure. Everyone feels like a failure sometimes. That's because everyone has failed a number of times. Thomas Edison, who has succeeded more than most, said, I have not failed, I just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Sometimes it takes getting through 10,000 failures or obstacles to get a project done. Sometimes it just feels that way. 
If you feel like you'll eventually succeed on a project or initiative, you're more likely to conquer thousands of obstacles and enjoy successes. When you are more successful, simple stressors don't trigger the stress response so much and you'll avoid those deleterious chemicals. We look upon the same sun as Plato, Galileo, and Shakespeare. They faced many of the same slings and arrows as we, and in the case of Galileo, probably more. They saw the same sun as their contemporaries, but thought about it differently and elevated their fields of endeavor. Rather than obsess about stressful situations in their lives, they focused on what was possible creatively, or at least they did it enough to produce inspiring and immortal works. It is unlikely that any of us will be remembered as well as they, but we are part of that same Western tradition in which they are luminaries. Our knowledge of their achievements elevates our consciousness and sets a standard of excellence for which we can strive. We could stand on their shoulders to reach the sky. We too can gaze upon the sun, or we can gaze at the sea or sky, and we could use them as an inspiration for knowing that in the grand scheme of things, our current stressors will pass, as will our ecstasies. In a thousand years, when others look to the same sun, sea, and sky, they won't know the obstacles to your achievements, but they're likely to be better off if you are able to make constructive contributions to your community or just your consciousness, which will act as a contagion to those in your community. So how do you want to spend your mental energy? Do you want to fuss about those who denigrate your efforts? Or do you want to use your imagination to inspire yourself to engage in endeavors that will elevate your spirits? As Pablo Picasso said, some painters transform the sun into a yellow spot. Others transform a yellow spot into the sun. Allow yourself the esteem and confidence to think and imagine in such a way that turns the prosaic into poetry. If you fuss and fret about the things that aren't imminent dangers to you, then you won't have the psychic energy to be creative or enjoy life to its fullest potential. If you acknowledge your achievements, honor yourself daily with healthy habits and charitable feelings, you'll handle stressful situations with more confidence and you'll be healthier tomorrow when the sun rises again. So, get into the habit of healthy behaviors, take a brisk daily walk, get plenty of sleep and eat fresh whole foods so that you perform with optimal energy. If you believe you deserve the best, you need to honor yourself with the best health habits. Then. Build a bastion of better self-esteem by participating in daily gratitude practice, a daily to-do list, and mentally affiliate yourself with a tradition that will inspire you to perform to your best ability. Be sure to acknowledge your talents are valuable to society. And to keep you on track, surround yourself with those reminders that you are worthy, accomplished, and beloved, and step out with confidence to a successful future. And maybe, in a thousand years, someone will know the difference.